Please pronounce your name correctly for me. My name is Allegheny Meadows. And you were born and raised in California. Yeah, that's correct. I was born in Berkeley, California in 1972. You're only one year older than me. So I'm 46. So what am going to be nice. 47. Yeah, I think that's Yeah, right. I just turned 48 years old. It's amazing. Uh, time is an interesting thing that we're involved with. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good and bad, depending, but yeah. All right. So one of my big questions that I always start with is basically sort of how did you get to your path, your creative path? So was it family? Were they creative uh, teachers, life experiences? How did you sort of find your path in your creative industry? That's a great thing to think about where we come from. I um, was born in a very alternative culture in Berkeley. We lived in communes, had a ton of freedom. And we were able to sort of spend our days figuring things out. And I think that fascination and that, that freedom rather than a fear of the outside, but the freedom and the fascination and the tools led me to sort of find the greatest satisfaction in life in solving, solving things and figuring them out. You know, rather than being cooped up in a house or in an apartment, I was, I'd be given a saw and, and a hammer and nails and say, have a good day, you know, go make something, go figure, you know, go do what you want to do. And what age were you given a saw and a hammer? I, I was like six years old. I mean, that's, that would, that would know, be really, illegal now. Yeah, I know. You'd have to sign a waiver as a parent to give a handsaw to your kid, right? But no, I remember, I think I was five years old and my mom gave me a socket set and it was a really nice craftsman socket set. And I was like, wow. And then, so I started taking things apart, which could be a problem sometimes <laughs> if you don't put them back together. <laughs> but I feel like part of the, the foundation that has allowed me to become an artist and an entrepreneur and you know someone who just loves figuring things out is, is from that really early childhood time of given the freedom to sort of try things and the freedom to fail with those and then to try to figure them out again. And it became a responsibility as well. You know, sometimes there was something that actually had to get fixed. And those skill sets could have led me many directions. I could have, you know, I could be a mechanic. I could be doing all kinds of things that still fulfill that inner need of solving and figuring out. But somehow through my mother was an artist, a painter. She went to Corcoran in the 50s. And I was able, growing up and through high school in Mendocino, California, to have many role models who were making a living as creative artists in their studio and, and putting their work out into the world. And so it wasn't just engineers and mechanics and, and people in a more sort of traditional sense and in American culture, at least, who I could see being successful using that skill set, but it was artists, you know, somebody making sculpture or uh, making art cars or in high school, I worked for a potter during the summer and really fell in love with that process and the community that came in around in the ceramic community, much more so than say my mom's community and painters who they always sort of would pose with each other and be nervous with each other. And the potters would just Often they would build kilns and equipment that were much bigger than what they needed. And the whole point of that was that you would need help from other people and they would bring their work and you would fire the kilns together and create this thing that's much larger than an individual. It is an interesting medium, the you know pottery, clay, whatever you want to work with, ceramics kind of stuff. They are very often them and printmakers I often find to be the most sort of communal group working kind of uh, artists versus painters and photographers and other people who are very individual uh, kind of people because a lot of your equipment is reasonably expensive basically. Yeah printmaking very much process oriented as well and I, I totally agree uh, and some wood shop you know and so going to something like Anderson Ranch Art Center where I grew up in Mendocino, there was a small art center called the Mendocino Art Center. And it had a printmaking program and it had a fiber arts program and a ceramic program. So in high school, I was fortunate enough to be able to enroll there and learn, learn pottery or start to learn it. 
and sort of the the seeds were set for me uh, at the end of high school, realizing that pottery held more challenge and more reward than anything I had experienced prior to that. And I really wanted to work with ceramics. I had been to museums in San Francisco, the, the De Young and the Asian Art Museum, and had seen work from many different centuries where people were asking similar questions of their culture and of the material and trying to make, you know, make what they thought was beautiful or what they thought related to their culture at that time through the materials they had available. And I, I sort of dove into that process. And, uh, a teacher, I'm sorry, a, a friend of mine, his father had been to Princeton and was a doctor, but one of his classmates had written a book called The Road to Miyama. And I can't remember the author's name right now, but as a young woman, she had gone to a village in Japan called Miyama and had apprenticed with a potter and had written a book about what that was like. And I believe that was in the 70s that she had done that. And so when I was in high school, I was read this book and I thought, oh my goodness, that just sounds incredible. Like what an experience to step into a completely different culture and world. So that influenced me amongst many other stories and, and books in Asian studies and Zen Buddhism to want to go study abroad in Japan. It's interesting. You and I seem to sort of run in similar spheres. Actually, I went to the Corcoran, much like your mother, and I actually went to the San Francisco Art Institute uh, as my graduate program. Brilliant. So, yeah, we're, we're sort of in the same, running around the same neighborhoods. That's great. Well, there's some really good creative things going on in those neighborhoods. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my master's program. That To me, that was the best education I got of all of them. Nothing personal to all my other educations, but that was the best one that I got. Now, you're also a teacher and you run, you run workshops, you run a gallery, you run, you have many different um, things going on. I saw, I think it's called Saw, and then you have a bunch of other stuff. Please tell me. So how did you get from wanting to be a potter to sort of running your own gallery, creating your community outreach programs, being a teacher, all these kinds of things, because like, that's, that's a lot of things on your plate. Yeah. I, uh, I don't tend to say no to many things, which even when they're in my own head, you know, we have these, these brainstorms that it's like a lightning storm, right? And then it's a new idea, and how do we how do we weed those out or filter those out, and and allow the the most significant ones to marinate for a while and and bring them to fruition. I think so. One thing that I think is a benefit to my various projects is I grew up incredibly monetarily poor, and there wasn't things weren't handed to us. So we were given tools, you know, there was all this creative thing, but there was, a, there were a lot of financial struggles as well. And so I have learned that I want to make a living and I want to have that aspect of where does my food come from be somewhat comfortable. I don't want to stress about, you know, do I have enough money to go to the grocery store? So my approach to being, you know, to art, Often, you know, I've chosen to be a potter because pottery has, it's somewhat of a commodity. It, it has um, functional pottery is an art form that because of the utilitarian nature, it can appeal to a wide audience. Somebody doesn't have to be confident in understanding their perception of the world to see a a cup of mine and, and think, oh, I might be able to really enjoy drinking coffee out of that. So in a way, it's somewhat of a gateway drug to the art world. Very much so. So through that practicality, that has led me in many directions to the commitment to want to make a living. So the entrepreneurial parts of how do I market and sell my work, after graduate school, and uh, I went to school at Alfred University in upstate New York. And I realized after graduate school that I didn't want to go be a professor full time because I felt like for me to really understand how to be a potter and, or how to get back to academia, I needed to be immersed in my studio and immersed in, in the field for a while and try to understand what that was and, and to you know find my own way of being in it. So 
we settled here in Colorado in a little town called Carbondale. And very quickly, I realized that I needed to figure out where the best market was for my work and how to communicate with my audience. And Well, that's a huge question that all creative people need to take some time and think about because I find that oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, artists' best market is not where they live. Yes, very true. And my experience is there is a great market here where I do live, but not enough to sustain us. You know, we chose to live a half an hour from Aspen, Colorado because of the potential market. So what I did though, uh, a friend and I, a couple years after graduate school, we decided, I believe it was his father gave him an old airport shuttle van that he had, that, you know, this huge Dodge van that barely ran. And we made enough work to, and set up these sort of Tupperware home sales around the country. And we taught workshops at universities to help pay the gas and pay our expense. But then we would have a show or a sale in somebody's home. So a friend of, of his in Dallas, Texas, she invited 50 of her closest friends and we set up work all over her kitchen and living room and people came and they bought work directly from us. And then we moved on to a place in Tennessee and then a, a roommate of mine in college, his parents lived on Central Park West and we, they did the same thing for us. And, you know, at each venue, we might sell 20 to 50 pots. And so by the time we got home back to Colorado, it was three weeks later and we were really ready to be home. But the idea of taking our work out to these markets was really pretty solid. So a few years later, I found myself in 2001, I bought an old Airstream trailer that was available locally, thinking it would be a great guest house and, and actually thinking that I could remodel it and it, my mom could live in it because she was still you know, an aging hippie artist who was traveling around and didn't have a stable place to live. Well, September 11th happened and the world kind of turned upside down and priorities, everything shook out. And she looked at it and said, there's no way I could live in this. It's, you know, it's really trashed. And it was it needed, you know, it needed to be gutted down to the frame. But I was teaching in North Carolina uh, with that same friend who had the Dodge van. We went to teach an eight week class at Penland School up in the mountains. And it's called Great the Concentration. School. Yeah, isn't that an amazing place? It's incredible. so good. Yeah, I lived in Wilmington, North Carolina for a while. Oh, incredible. Okay. So Penland's this little, not little, but uh, sort of art, isolated artist retreat where workshops are taught and they have lots of different levels of programming. But it was there that I realized I should turn that Airstream into a traveling gallery uh, showroom. I could use it at my own house, but I could also take it to cities, universities, museums, you know, take it to an educated market. And that really led me on a path of trying, you know, starting to understand what a gallery is, because it was never going to be about my own work. It was a, a larger group. There were six of us involved in the beginning. And I found that, you know, if six of us each know 20 people, there's 120 people who potentially could come rather than one person only knowing 20 people. And this is, you know, pre-website type days, pre-social media. So our advertising really was through ceramic communities and art communities in different towns we would go to. This is now the 19th year of that project. And it, for one reason or another, it has continued on. It hasn't grown to be some financially successful thing. It's just constantly been a source of income and education and outreach. I mean, it's sort of it fulfills me on lots of different levels as an artist, as a creative project. There's so many things to figure out with it. I mean, for me, it takes a similar energy that my studio time takes. Well, and that's one of the big things that a lot of artists or young artists or even artists who haven't found a way to be successful or whatever yet uh, have a difficulty with, which is that balancing act of how much time and energy to put into creating work and how much time and energy into the business of the arts, whether it's marketing, public relations, sales, whatever, like trying to find the right balancing act for that is very difficult for many people, myself included. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I actually struggle with that balancing act continuously. I mean, it's not, there isn't a, a clear path figured out. 
But I can say that Airstreams or other trailers are an amazing way. Like if you're a young artist and have lots of ideas and not necessarily a market or galleries representing your work, there is it is so great to work with other people, form somewhat of a collective and figure out how to show your work. The idea is to get your work in front of an audience so it can communicate. An example recently last year, I was in another project called SAW, which is Studio for Arts and Works. I was trying to sort of figure out a way to clean up a bunch of other equipment and things that we had out in the yard of this, it's an 8,000 square foot building with 25 artists. And so there was other stuff. So I just needed to figure out where to put it. And I was going to buy another shipping container because those are kind of cool. And I called somebody who has shipping containers locally. And he, and he said, you know, I don't have any right now, but I have these semi trailers. You should come check them out. So I go over to his lot and there's a 26 foot semi box trailer for $1,500. It's watertight. It's got wheels. And he has a semi driver lady who charges a hundred bucks to move it. So I saw that and the wheels just clicked. And I thought, wow, there is a gallery space for saw 1500 bucks. I spent another 600 on some track lighting and I lined the inside with a, a particle board OSB and so we could hang work on it. And we have eight foot high, actually nine foot high ceilings, eight foot wide, 26 foot long. And you walk into it and it's this incredible, it feels so much bigger than it is. And it's an exhibition space where our building, we didn't, we're all about studios. We didn't have gallery space, but for a group of, you know, three or four younger artists to find a semi-trailer and figure that out and each put $600 in and some sweat equity. And they have an exhibition space and they can then now with social media, you can, you can invite 500 people once a month and have an opening, right? Sure. Oh yeah. I mean, the idea of doing collectives seems to be something that I'm hearing more and more about mm -hmm. uh, that the artists are beginning to realize that while the romantic idea of artists in the studio, smoking cigarettes and drinking coffee and stuff, it doesn't really exist anymore. And, and these days, a, a lot more of it is about finding your community and sort of building your networks and, and uh, tribe or whatever you want to call it. And, and, you know, doing it the way you're talking about where exponentially, you know, 10 people are going to know 100 people instead of just one person knowing 10 people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, which I love this conversation. It brings up something that a, a mentor of mine, a sculptor who lives here named James Searles, I heard him say this about 10 years ago, that a healthy, sustainable art community, it has education. It has a place where artists can make work or places like studio. And it has a place to exhibit and show what, the, what you're making. And it potentially has a collector base or a, a support base that might help put money into that sort of experiment and system. And I think it's really like I teach in universities quite often where I'll be a visiting artist or I'll teach for three or four days, you know, or a week. And often students will, will ask, you know, all right, how, like they want to jump forward to the marketing. How do I market it? Which is very important to understand, but I think the primary fundamental thing before that really can be approached is how do you, how do you express yourself? What do you want to say through the world? And it's really with so many things available now that appear to be finished and polished, you know, as far as through Instagram or through the media where we have images flooding that look like they're finished and figured out. And for a young student, it's, you know, how do you find something that you're, that you would live and die for that you need to say that you want to say to the world? Well, and that it's the, a unique thing that is sort of original and sort of, yeah, I keep using these words like authentic and things like this, but like their own unique vision on whatever it is. So with, mm -hmm. no matter what the topic is or whatever the medium is, they've got to add something to the vernacular. They can't just keep repeating what's already been said. Definitely. Yeah. Very well said. And it's a huge challenge and it probably has always been a challenge. 
I just feel like right now we are, rather than receiving a magazine once a month that shows us what has been edited by the curators of the magazine and they're choosing to highlight and write about, now, you know, with a couple touches of your thumb or your finger, you can see many things that are self-published and self-edited, you know, self and that doesn't necessarily mean they're good or mean that they're coming from a deep well. I think that when artists can dig deep in and really investigate their own questions. I remember being an art student and basically me and all of my co-students and whatever colleagues, we only knew whatever our library had or what was out in the magazine that month or what our teacher somehow introduced us to. And we didn't know anything beyond that really. But these days with social media and the internet and all these things, like I feel like there's so much more than is necessary that are we're a bit overloaded and oftentimes either intimidated uh, to make works or start a new idea or whatever, or simply fearful because like we, the society has changed into this sort of cult of personality and this cult of likes and favoring, you know, followers and all this stuff that doesn't really have a direct relationship to quality. I definitely agree. That's a, that's a big challenge. I feel like as a young student though, I don't, I don't know that quality was any easier to find as a young student for myself either though. And that was the in ceramics. That was the interesting thing. Uh, I had some very good teachers, but when I would pick up the magazines, there were some often things in there that were just abhorrent. Oh yeah. And, you know, and I think why in the world would anybody choose to spend time on that? So, you know, sort of how we develop a critical eye is probably one of the best things or skills or tools to be able to move forward for a lifetime of making art and figuring out how to put it into the world. I worry for the next generation, like how are they getting that critical eye if their eye is being created through social media? Yeah, I do agree. I think the risk anywhere for, our, for let's see how to say this, with success, and, you know, sort of, okay, so a social media post that might have a bunch of likes might lead somebody to continue to try to make social media posts that are similar to that, because that might get more attention. The same thing could have happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 100 years ago, easily, where an artist who's working and struggling to figure out their vision and their voice and then they, they hit a couple pieces or a body of work that gets a lot of attention and success by the marketplace. And then they start moving continually in that direction and, and they lose the vitality and the vision that made the first body of work so good. Right. But you're using the term body of work and all this. And, and I agree with that. And the issue that I have with that is, is that bodies of works that were well received, they would take a year to two years to create before they could even be on exhibition or in a publication or whatever. The stuff that's happening now is so fast that there's no time to reflect. Mm, I, I totally agree with you. I, I definitely do. I mean, there are people, I, a friend and I who were in graduate school together 23, 24 years ago, we we were commenting just the other day on an artist, a young artist that we know that's now in the same graduate program that is sort of posting daily social media images of all these questions and works in progress. And it is a very different, it's a different approach to refining a body of work over a period of time, like you just said, and, and then choosing how you want to put that into the world. I mean, you're essentially bringing somebody in almost a reality TV style where they get to watch your creative process and your failures. But the challenge is that when those creative questions are put out and then one of those gets lots of attention as a student, it can inform somebody or influence them to head that direction to what the wider world thinks 
is your best work rather than your deeper personal questions. Well, but to a certain extent, don't you still have that even in your own work? Because you produce uh, utilitarian pottery mostly. I've seen some sculptural works as well. But I mean, anytime any creative person is working, so I'll use you as an example, since we're talking about you, that, that you go out, let's say you go out in the airstream and you go around and you're selling stuff and then you come back and you go, hey, you know what? The things that were this color or this size, or this shape, they seem to sell well. I mean, that ends up influencing you to maybe produce more like that, or more in that size, or more in that color. It does. No, that's a very good point. It also, though, like for me, I am committed to making cups. That's something that's really important to me, and the way that that cup is held by the user, by the viewer, physically held, it touches their lips. There's something really fundamental to me about that being able to communicate through those moments. And so for me, I found that a cup can, I can make almost anything within that five by five inch realm. And it seems to find a home. So there are times where I think maybe for me, the clearest example of what we're talking about is I do accept commissions. And so I will accept a commission to make a set of dishes for somebody and we will base it on the, what I'm currently working on, the glaze palette that I currently have, the forms and shapes, and we'll design it together out of those. But I am often approached by people who will ask, you know, Hey, can you make whatever this is? And it's out in left field. And my answer luckily now is, well, no, this is, the scope of my work right now is in front of us and we can, if, if this doesn't appeal to you, I'm sorry, you know, I'm not going to make something that's outside of, of what I'm currently working on. The reason I'm able to do that is that I sort of have a deeper vision, you know, that happened through my education and some deeper questions that I'm not willing to compromise on. You know, what does it mean to make art? What does it mean to make what I want to make in the world? And so there is a balance being, you know, somebody, you know, being a utilitarian potter. There's definitely a balance in there because I want the work to go find homes. Well, I saw you also have this interesting the Airstream library, which yeah. sounds super great if I were living near you, which I'm not. But so tell the listeners a little bit about the library. Yeah. Uh, in 2009, at a ceramic conference in Phoenix called Inseca, which is about education and ceramic art the economy was in the toilet and a group of six of us who are, you know, friends and, you know, some, one, it was my perfect, one of my professors from graduate school, sort of different generations. We got together and tried to kind of brainstorm, like how could the art stream project do some things that were more about social outreach. And one, uh, Linda Sakura, one of my friends and teachers, she said, well, what about a library? And three of us, Younger folks there ran with it. It was like, wow, that's brilliant. Sure, we can lend artwork and it can communicate. It can do everything it needs to do to be fulfilling as an object, except it won't be based on monetary exchange. So we we started this. We invited 13 potters, younger and established, to contribute up to five cups each. And we built these beautiful boxes that are you know, really designed it like a lending library for nice art books where they're, you know, they're appreciated and they're protected. You can borrow it for a week and the exchange is you have to submit a photograph of it in use. And that's, that's the creative exchange. That doesn't, I have used it here locally a number of times, but we, we tend to ship the entire project to a host. So currently as we speak, it's actually at MICA in Baltimore, the Maryland Institute College of Art. It's actually there on lockdown in their library because nobody's in the building. But we had set up, I shipped it to them in January, and we had set up where the art stream was going to be on tour of the East Coast in March and would have been a two-day visiting artist, and the library would have been open and in use. The host tends to keep it for a month, and it's in circulation during that time. And it's been hosted by individual small art groups, to uh, single professors and classes, to larger libraries, to museums. 
And the only cost for the host is the shipping charges to get these three crates that hold the whole library. So we've left it at MICA and hopefully they'll be able to open up in the fall. We're not sure what the future looks like, but their art library uh, spent a bunch of time figuring out how they wanted to integrate. You know, it literally has a typewriter that comes with it and return due date stamp. I mean, it's based on libraries when I was a child and when I was in college where there's a little blue card that goes inside the jacket. Now libraries are obviously a little bit more digital in the way they lend and scan codes and things like that. And so the MICA art library put together how they wanted to circulate it. And uh, hopefully the world changes back to a way where we can circulate, you know, cups that were are used on our lips. And, you know, obviously there's a different health standard that will be met someday along the way there. But it's really an exciting project. It looks really great. I, I hope it comes to Europe sometime. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Speaking of Europe, uh, about five years ago, a, a place in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia, was interested in the art stream coming. And so the one I have is 30 feet long and pretty cumbersome. And so at that time, I found a 20-foot smaller Airstream and remodeled it and collaborated with an artist friend at Colorado State in Fort Collins named Del Harrow. And he had his digital fabrication class approach the interior of this Airstream with, you know, I was sort of the architecture client. And it was amazing for them to, you know, how they built out the inside with a Baltic birch and just really beautiful ways to think about displaying art and ceramics and, you know, small three-dimensional objects. But the goal was to put it on a ship in Houston and send it to Europe and then get a vehicle there and go on a tour. So we'll see what happens in the future. Okay. Well, I'm here in Prague <laughs> if you come through. That'd be amazing. So one of the things that I'm interested in through this podcast is basically I've been in academia, full-time academia for 15, 20 years. And I realize that I've lost touch with like how practicing artists do the business and run the business and how they make a living. Uh, you know, I'm often giving students like advice, like, oh yeah, do this, do that. And then I'm like realizing like, I don't do these things and I don't know if they work anymore. So my question to you is, is like, how do you, how do you juggle and, and create your sort of diverse incomes? Cause it sounds like you have a lot of different sort of income streams. Um, and then how do you balance that with your public relations and your business? And then of course your time creating work itself. So like basically the, how do you run your business? Now, that's a great thing to contemplate and talk about. And uh, I should say, I also have a family. I have three children and, and wife and their life is full. Pets? Any pets? pets? Oh yeah. We have uh, 20 chickens, <laughs> two bunnies. <laughs> a few days ago, we got a pony for our 11 year old daughter, two dogs, a hamster and a guinea pig. So yeah. Okay. You have uh, a full life. Yeah. It's a full life. Just that one little part is a full life, but how I make a living. So for a long time, that's evolved over time for many years, it was primarily my own studio and the art stream started to become a vehicle, uh, literally and figuratively, to be able to sell more of my own work, but also to sell other people's work. And it, it went out of the realm of a collective and into, I own it, I'm responsible, I take 50% of the sales. And I do my darndest to make sure that I send artists checks rather than sending their work back. So I'm trying to figure out, you know, with a group of people helping out as well, it's not just all my own effort, but you know, it's, sort of a quasi collective where I'm, I'm the one responsible, basically. So the art stream led to an invite to start a land based gallery in Aspen by a developer who had some space, and they couldn't figure out how to fill it. And a friend who had worked with me on art stream and had also been at Anderson Ranch together, Sam Harvey and myself started the Harvey Meadows gallery in 2005. And we had this idea that the Aspen community uh, would support ceramic art and they would be a great way. You know, we didn't see the work that we loved being shown there. It was mostly blue chip. And then there's this sort of whole aspect of uh, Western art being shown. And we just thought, wow, what a great opportunity for us to 
put the work we love into this. And through his and my friendships and connections, we were able to open with work like by Betty Woodman and Peter Volkus. And some of the greatest of our heroes said, sure, we'll do this. We'll send you five pieces. And it was based on the art stream having been successful and proven that you know I could run a business. So we ran a brick and mortar gallery as well as the art, I ran the art stream and I also had family, a smaller family at that point, one child, and my own studio practice. The gallery in Aspen had some successful years and some slower years, and but it was never reliable enough that the other projects could be put away. I'm sure that if it was incredibly financially successful, we could have hired people to help and it would have changed life dramatically. But what it did is it added another intense project to the list. The same year I started the gallery, I was given a small amount of money as a down payment to try an architect friend and I found this warehouse building that used to be a chainsaw shop. And we decided, yeah, let's borrow money. They were giving out money at that point. You know, it was, I don't know why they gave it to us, but it was great. It was basically loans. You know, you have a small down payment and they would loan you money. So we bought this derelict warehouse, fixed it up by ourselves with a couple of friends helping and started renting out artist spaces. And he put his architecture office in there. And so that saw, and over time, you know, he needed to move on and various things happen. And we had an offer to buy it from us. And I knew that if I took the money and put it in my bank account, that it would be gone. So that little bit of profit, I it was lucky enough to find a building that was in foreclosure and buy a much bigger building and take the leap to just go for it. And so now that's what SAW is now, is a bigger building. And I've got 25 artist spaces myself I, that's where my studio is as well and the idea of the real estate things is that someday i might be able to quote retire because as a self-employed artist there's never really enough to put into a 401k or any kind of a retirement but the real estate in theory if it goes along okay in 25 years it's it's paid for and perhaps it can still generate income you know, so if I'm 70 and not able to work on all of these different projects still, I can uh, have a, you know, some supplement to the income. Two years ago, I stepped away from the gallery in Aspen. I just could not deal with 15 years of back and forth. You know, it's a half an hour away during super easy traffic. And in the winter, during a snowstorm, during the holiday season, when it's busy there, it could take an hour and 20 minutes for me to get home. And it just started to wear on, you know, time. And, and uh, you know, actually I had a very close friend who was young in his 30s. He passed away, car accident. And it just helped me to start to examine how I was choosing to spend my time. And if it were all in tomorrow, am I living, the, the making choices right now about how I want to spend my time to the best of my values and, you know, to my own heart? Am I really listening? To what I want to do. And so it became pretty clear that I didn't want to drive up and down the valley all the time and continue that. There are parts that I missed tremendously, but, it, you know, so yeah, I think I answered part of your question. Sorry, I'm a little bit of a rambler this morning. No, it, no, no it's great. I mean, okay, so, but along that, all right, how do you sell your current work so do you have galleries representing you do you sell through online do you use social media like what's your uh personal avenue to get your work out into the world so this year is different but up until now the primary way i sell my work is through the aspen farmers market and my airstream is parked on the same spot on the street every Saturday between, you know, tomatoes and vegetables and a glass blower on the other side. And just, I've been doing that market for almost 20 years since before I had the Airstream. I did, I was one of the first craft vendors up there. And there are people that were five years old and would come in and see my work. And now they're getting married and they're asking for a set of dishes for their wedding. So from June 15th to October 15th, every Saturday, that's 
how I've made my living. And even running the gallery and saw and all these other places, my studio work had to still generate about 50% of our income. So it, the pressure was always on for me to work in my studio. And I do show in galleries around the country. And now I'm going to be figuring out what's next because there's a strong chance that the Aspen farmer's market will not be allowed to happen this year. As far as the virus and Aspen was a hot spot with all the travelers coming through and it spread locally pretty rapidly. So we're not sure what this summer looks like. But the fascinating thing for me is that, so I was ready to take the art stream on tour and it has my work in it this year. It had 35 artists total, including myself. And we had everything ready to go and it was March 10th and we canceled. For, thank God we canceled and didn't continue forward. March 12th, I decided to create an online gallery for Artstream. And we have a web designer who's been doing the website for a long time. And she's super familiar with how to create an online sales platform. And we opened our online gallery eight days later. And it's been incredibly successful. I've sold almost 700 pieces of pottery uh, through a computer. And it's an amazing new thing. I'm learning so much about how it functions and how it works and what, you know, how to express myself through it. So one thought is this summer that if the farmer's market's not happening, each Saturday I will upload 10 to 20 pieces as if it's another, you know, Saturday market offering and continue that engagement you know, and ship the work out, or perhaps there'll be local people who come pick it up if I set it outside, or, you know, we'll see how the world evolves. But it's a, it's an evolving platform for how I sell my work and continue to find homes for it and make a living. Well, and that idea of doing online sales that are sort of time-based, like putting an exclusivity saying these items will begin to be on sale at this time. And then once they're sold out, they're sold out. People love that stuff. It seems to be engaging. You know, people are really excited to see what's coming next and there's a freshness to it, which I mean, it engages me. I, keep going on there as the person running the back end of the whole thing. I'm, I go on there and I'm like, Oh, you know what one piece is sold today. And it doesn't mean somebody's buying a, a large quantity of work, but you know, it seems like still, you know, there was a lot of excitement about the online gallery in March, April, and now it's started to taper off a bit, which is fine. But you know, later today I need to ship 15 boxes of pottery to people. And it, you know, it's, it's fantastic. So we'll see what evolves for the future. I do think it, for me, it's very important to be able to exhibit my work locally. And I will continue to ship work out nationally and see how this online thing works. Now, starting out from scratch right now to create an online gallery, I think would be a huge challenge. You know, I started Artstream online, but it's been 19 years of building goodwill and building following and being known throughout you know, the country as a place where you can see relevant and, and high quality art. You know, so I'm a curator in that sense of being a gallerist or a gallery owner. And that track record is what allowed the online thing to succeed quickly and not have to be built up from nothing. Yeah, you brought up two topics there, which is one, reputation, mm -hmm. which I believe the art, not even just the arts, creative industries. So all creative industries, reputation is everything. Because if you have a, if you, if, if in any way you have a bad reputation, your entire career could be ruined in whatever part of the creative world you're in. And also mm -hmm. the need to start to build your network locally. And then that local network will then introduce you to farther networks like the, the, create I find that creative people if they think about building their local network first and they do a good job of that and build a good reputation that that network will sort of become the growth the foundation of an additional network that will go farther and farther out into the world I completely agree and you know being on both sides of that having a gallery uh, or had a, a larger gallery for a long time uh, my approach to 
to this is that the artists that we would choose to work with were basically business partners. We were in it together. And, you know, I still, I'll hear people ripping on galleries and there are some galleries that have done very dishonest things and are non-reputable, obviously. And there are artists who also have, you know, fulfill, you know, worn that hat. But for me, you know, it was so important to want to work with people. And obviously I needed to be engaged by their aesthetic and what they were making. But, you know, like an example would be, yes, the artist is giving half of the commission, you know, usually 50% to the gallery. But nowadays, if an artist, let's say there was a piece in the gallery that was $500, and then the artist might have their own website. And if they didn't have the same price, then let's say they only had it for 400 for a similar scale piece. Then the person who's interested in buying it or interested in viewing it would start to lose trust. It's not about the individual sale. It's about the long-term trust that you brought up and how do it, you know, these long-term relationships, you know, it's not about like, yes, I want to make $500 today. It's about how can that person continue to tell their friends and to support us and to say like, wow, these guys really, I like working with them. They're a pleasure to work with. I trust them. I trust the value of what they have. And so if, if somebody can look online and search for an artist's name and they find similar work for 20 or 30% less in a different place, it, it erodes that trust and that relationship. It's difficult because there are like, I mean, I ran into this out of my own stupidity because I put work on different online outlets, you know, artsy and those kinds of places, Saatchi and all these things. Mm -hmm. And I accidentally put different prices on different websites, even though it was very, very similar size and and quality of works and and i got called out on it some people were like hey why is it cheaper here than there it's still you and i'm like because i simply messed up like i made the mistake yeah and it's great to learn from our mistakes you know i mean the whole point of of these are to approach with you know high integrity and try our best to you know make the work we want to make and put it out into the world i mean running a gallery and becoming very very close friends with people who I would say our collectors, I just started to understand that it's really about relationships and the gallery is the conduit between uh, an individual or a group, you know, collaborative artist studio practice and what they're figuring out, you know, we're the conduit and the relationship builder to somebody who might want to live with that work and, and might want to pay for that work. And that's a really, it's, it's an amazing thing. I mean, the way we perceive artwork, is so affected by the context in which we first meet that artwork. Okay, I have yeah, I have a question on that. Okay. Nothing personal, don't take this personally. Oftentimes people see ceramic artists, uh, especially people who do dishware and, and cups and stuff more as utilitarian and functional forms of art. Your words you're using are things where you're referring to it as an art piece first. So in your mind, when you create work, is it, are you thinking, how does it function or how is its aesthetics or its intention or its concept? Like, which is the priority for you in your creative process? So I believe that how something communicates is the content. And what I'm trying to say, if I was painting on canvas, I would be trying to communicate through that, through my choice. All, it's all about choices and communication. What am I trying to say? And so if I'm choosing to communicate through a cup, that is the content. All the layers that I can put into that cup. Ron Nagel is an artist, shows with Matthew Marks now he works on small scale cups and granted they aren't necessarily, you're not going to put tequila in one of them, but these are, that's the content. That's part of the content of the work is scale and form. And then he can layer all these other sense of expression within that. And so for me, 
there isn't a hierarchy on whether you can physically pick it up or not. I feel like it's about communication and relationship. So if I had a Ken Price sculpture in the gallery that was in the shape of a cup or in the shape of a, a you know, sort of this sexual fantasy type of thing that he worked on for a long time, you know, for me, it's about communication. Okay. But what I, I want to break it down to just a real pretty straightforward answer on this. If, if you have made a piece and somebody purchased it, which is, do you feel is sort of a higher a respect for it, it being used every day or it being put up and on display? I intend everything, you know, let's just continue with a coffee cup. I intend for that. I make it so that it's higher level of communication is when it touches your body and what you see down on the inside of the cup as you're drinking and the way that your fingers hold the texture. To me, that is a really important thing. That cup, when somebody slips, it drops and it's, and it breaks and it's gone from that form that I had intended. And it still has this emotional relationship to them, right? So for me, it's about that relationship. So there are pieces of mine in museums and those don't get to experience that level of communication. But in the same way, they get to experience, they're stripped of that physical touch and they experience the visual communication. So I, I pay strong attention to that as well. But no, my, I think my highest, the most intimate times in our day when somebody's sitting in their pajamas, waking up, drinking coffee, that's where I want to be. That's where I want them to touch what I've made. You know, And I think for me that I have a shelf of cups made by many different people who I have relationships with or I have a fascination with their work and I don't necessarily know them. And I learn so much during those moments. But it doesn't devalue, you know, I mean, for me, that's like saying, so there's a collector that passed away that lived here named John Powers. And he has one of the largest collections of Jasper John Strongs. And he built a museum for the work here. But many people of that generation, he had incredible work. And not just, you know, large scale Warhols, but actually small drawings with notes that said, you know, Dear John and Kimiko, thank you for your support. And it's a drawing that he would give them, you know, people. And so at one point I was in his house and having this amazing dinner. I went into the bathroom and there's this phenomenal little drawing when you're sitting on the toilet that you get to experience. Now, is that less important or more important than the nine Warhol geishas over the dining table that were a portrait of his wife, Kimiko? No, you know, like for me, I love that there could be this thing in the bathroom that is just loaded with content. I think the highest form of flattery is to have a piece of artwork in somebody's bathroom. I know that sounds ridiculous, That's but fantastic. it it's the place you contemplate. It's the place you relax. It's the, it's a, it's a quiet place and it's a place that everybody in the house experiences. So like if you choose to put a piece of art in a bathroom, that is where that's something you want to see and think about and engage with every single day, multiple times a day. Yeah. And can you imagine taking a cup of coffee in with you to the bathroom? My wife. <laughs> no, but really like, those intimate spaces and those intimate moments are where I want my artwork to be comfortable. And so that's why I don't make my work, I consciously don't make it challenging, right? I don't want somebody to be like, God, this hurts my hand. I want them to have, through comfort, be able to see what I'm up to and experience what I'm up to. And, and through familiarity, you know, there, there are people I have a friend and client in Philadelphia and he called me one day and he was like, you're not going to believe this, but I can't find my cup. And I said, come on, you got to have some other cups in the house. And he said, no, I, every day for the last year, I use your cup that my wife gave me and I can't find it. It's not in the dishwasher. You know, you got to send me another cup. Like this is not going to work. And I realized like, wow, 
you're really dependent on this familiarity of this one ritual to sort of, you know, experience the world. Oh yes. I have my one tea mug that I use every single day and when it breaks, which it inevitably will, I will be very sad, but you know, that you move on and you, you find a new ritual. So like it allows you to then create right. something new through the loss of one thing. So right. there's a certain amount of sadness when you lose your, your, your one coffee cup. So I have this kind of fun theory that when we first get, like when you first got that cup, you had a certain uh, relationship to it, a certain new activation with your fingers, with your mouth, with how much it held. There was something that brought you to want to use that cup. And so my theory is that the, I believe the actual piece changes through time and through familiarity and through use and that, that objects are alive. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who has this kind of idea, but this that these objects are these sort of almost sentient beings that we have these relationship with and our perception changes with that over time, but that the, the, the cues and the colors and the forms, they physically evolve through a patina of experience or a patina of memory that comes into it. I had this experience where I, I picked up a teapot I hadn't used in years that had been packed away. And my first thing picking it up was remembering somebody that I had had tea with about a decade ago who had passed away. And so those layers of experience are in the work and they're, you know, they're a part of it. I recently saw a thing on social media somewhere. Somebody, somebody was asking, how do you clean out the stains at the bottom of a teacup? And I, I'm sitting there like, why would you want to clean those out? Like, that's the, that's the story of the teacup. Like it's, it's now got this nice patina inside that shows use, but some people feel the need to clean these things away. And I thought that was a little sad. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. What are those layers of use? All right. One last little topic I want to touch on. Um, so you do workshops and you've taught and you t still teach. I mean, obviously at the moment, some questionable issues with teaching, but wh what's your uh, sort of position on where academia is these days? Like my pers personal opinion, keep in mind, I'm from academia to a certain extent. <coughs> I'm very disillusioned with it at the moment because I think that the general art education that's offered is generally very expensive and it, it does a great job of teaching craftsmanship, concept, skills, all these things, but it does not effectively prepare these young creative people for the real world, the business uh, you know, contract laws, the, you know, how to do work-life balances, how to, you know, create, you know, cost return on investments and costs. I mean, all the business stuff, they don't effectively teach that. And I feel like we're creating a, a whole generation of young people who are going to have high expectations until the real world is going to sort of slap them down and say, you don't know what you're doing. Uh, well, let's see. I don't think it's any different now than it was 30 years ago. You know, this is an ongoing issue, right? Of, you know, not necessarily learning some practical aspects. That said, I think there are in, in the ceramic field, which is the one I know the most, I think there is an incredible amount of amazing work being made right now, perhaps more so than any other time. It's diverse. There is not a hierarchy on what process makes work better it's about concept and you can use any process necessary be it slip casting industrial to sort of digging your own clay and you're using the primordial hand to make something it's about concept so do i think that education could have seminars where people learn more practical things by all means yes in graduate school, I got a lot of that. There was a great graduate seminar where we had to put together portfolios and artist statements and try to understand how to communicate with galleries. And you know that was a seminar that was really important. No, it didn't show us how to track inventory and spreadsheets, 
where I, you know, I think a small business class would be a great thing, you know, sort of intro to small business could be a great thing for many, many people to learn and not just artists, but across the board, you know, how do you do that? I have only taught one university, you know, full semester. And it was a year ago. Now I taught for the university of Georgia in Cortona, Italy. So it was not exactly reality, but it was a semester long art program where we were learning Italian art. I was teaching ceramics. Uh, there was painting, printmaking, photography. Women's studies class was also offered. You know, So it was an academic semester. And at the end of it, there were a few graduating seniors who really wanted more information. And so I organized a little round table of the seven faculty and a bunch of students showed up who could ask us the sort of what next type of questions that were more what you're talking about, sort of a little more nuts and bolts, not just aesthetic and process. I think academia could really improve by teaching people after maybe it's the last semester of art school or the last year of art school. And, you know, I, I think it to be wise and not have it be a part of the aesthetic forming but have it be in sort of balance with that uh, would be really important. But yeah, and you also, the, the way I found you in the first place, you do workshops at places like Anderson Ranch and so on. How do you feel about workshops? I've only participated in one in my life as a, as a participant and I've never run any myself. How hard are they to, like I imagine as a, uh, let me take that back a step. How did you even get to running workshops? <laughs> like, <laughs> sure. Did, well, I mean, did, well, the question is, is like, did you put together a proposal to uh, a workshop uh, place like Anderson Ranch, or did you, or did they approach you? So, like, how did it even start? So, like, you know, like, if there's a, a person listening that has the, the abilities and skills to do something like a workshop at a place like these, you know, Anderson Ranch or something like that. How do they even get to do it? Well, I think there's a big variety of ways. There are some places that accept proposals. I think to put together a proposal of what you would want to teach and why is a really good exercise. And then, you know, it's almost like making a new body of work and then trying to figure out where you're going to show that, right? So if you have a process or a, a passion or a way of viewing things that you feel like is an important thing that you want to put into the world, you know, how are you going to put it out there? For me, I, I sort of, my education was in an art center in Northern California in Mendocino. And so a few years after I went away to college, the director there said, wow, I really like what you're making. Do you want to come teach a workshop? And so I just kind of led back to that. And then at Anderson Ranch, and I mean, I've taught workshops in many, many places, but at Anderson Ranch, I came. So after undergraduate, I went to Nepal. I had a Watson Fellowship to go study the potters in Nepal for a year. And while I was there, I met the director of Anderson Ranch, who told me about the artist in residence program. And I applied for that and landed at Anderson Ranch when I was 22 years old. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You were in Nepal and you happened to meet the director of the Anderson Ranch. Yeah, that's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> was the director of ceramics and sculpture. So I was living in this very remote village and I knew that Anderson Ranch was bringing a group of American artists to come work with potters in Nepal for a week and a half. And because I was there and I spoke the language fluently, I organized some on the ground logistics for them. And through that, I was able to meet them. But I was living in a little grass and clay hut and uh, when the when the group came to the village, and it was it was great. It was a great way to meet uh, in such a remote context or unfamiliar context. So my workshops through places like Anderson Ranch and Haystack Mountain School, a lot of those places, you know, they invite somebody. So if you're out there working, and it doesn't mean you've taught a lot of workshops, but you're just out there in your studio making work, putting it out into the world. I know at Haystack, I was on the board there for nine years and a lot of recommendations, you know, the board members would write out recommendations of who they think might be good teachers, be it established or new artists. Students who are there get 
on their evaluation of every workshop. They get to write recommendations of who they think would teach a good workshop. So it really is about the community, like you alluded to or mentioned earlier, that starting locally and building, you know, as a young artist, building a local group and local following in a sense, paying attention to anybody who's really interested in your work and figuring out how to get your work out there, that grows on itself. Because one of those local people might go, if you want to teach workshops, they might actually go be a student at Anderson Ranch and then they could write your name in of like, oh, you know, so-and-so would be a great teacher here and, and would teach about, you know, X, Y, Z. So one thing that I'm doing that I'm a little bit sad about, but it might actually happen is in this September coming up, I have a workshop slated at Anderson Ranch where my visiting artist is an amazing creative chef here at a restaurant in Aspen. And He'll come Barclay in. Dodge. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> He's phenomenal. And he will come into the class and talk about his aesthetic and his needs as a chef and what he's trying to present to his his audience who comes and experiences his art form over an hour and a half period and then and moves on uh, and consumes his art form, which is really pretty amazing. And then the workshop after three weeks will end in us having a meal on work on pottery dishes that we've designed in response to a menu he's presented us. So I really hope the world has opened up enough that we can do that this September. I will be sure to put a link to it in the, the notes for this podcast. Ah, thank you. But those kinds of things could happen anywhere. You know, a, there are lots of like in pottery, there are lots of chefs and restaurants looking for unique ways to present what they're making rather than a sort of plain white generic plate. And so for a young artist to approach a restaurant and see if there could be a working relationship, and it may be that it's a little bit of income. I mean, I did that when we first settled here in Carbondale, I went to a restaurant that had on its menu an offering called Random Acts of Cooking. And I thought, wow, that sounds amazing. And my wife and I, it was our anniversary, and I called and I said, you know, is there any way I'm a potter? I, can I bring you some dishes that you would serve our meal on? Because that would be really fun. And when I brought in and met the chef, I brought in a box of pots and he looked at them and he said, I'll only do this if you'll make me 20 of those and 15 of these. And I thought, wait a minute, that's not why I came, but I'd be delighted. So it started an ongoing relationship. And in the beginning, we traded my work for meals rather than him having to, you know, come up with what I needed. And then eventually he bought work as well. Nice. Love it when those relationships grow like that. Yeah. And it's really back to any medium and figuring out how you want to uh, approach an audience, how you, how you can get your work seen and experienced, whether it's in the bathroom or in the main hall of the gallery, right? Or both. It could be both. Or both. It could be both. Okay. Any topics you want to touch on that we haven't touched on? You know, there is, I think, one good thing. Recently, a student reached out and was doing an interview uh, as a project. They needed to interview an artist. And, and she asked me, sort of, what, are you, what is your main advice for how to succeed? And, and I think, this is going to sound funny, but I, I think you need to figure out your strengths and weaknesses. And I'm not talking about how you hold a paintbrush or how you, what kind of, you know, how you see things. I'm literally talking about therapy. I think the more you can dig in to what derails you and what makes you thrive on a personal level, the better chance of succeeding in anything, but especially in art, because in art, you're forging your own new way. You're not following along. It's not a set career path or it's not a set path like working at a bank. So there are so many unknowns that are headed your way that to dig into your own personal and start to unpack your own baggage uh, as soon as possible, I think is probably the best advice I could give. Well, I see for me, I keep thinking about the fact that I'm not, or at least I don't seem to be because I don't get rewarded with any grants or residency. So I, I think I'm not a very good writer about artworks when I mm. try to write artist statements and grants, written residencies and things like this, because 
you know, I do, it's not that I'm a bad writer. I think I'm actually a very good writer, but I don't seem to write correctly for their needs for whatever purpose. And so like knowing what your good, your strengths and your weaknesses are, even within your sort of endeavors, like some people might be really great at social media and other people might not be. Some people might be great at writing statements or grants or residency applications and others not. So accepting that you're not going to be everything in your thing, your industry and focusing on what you do really well is a great thing. But unfortunately, we don't all have the money to hire other people to help us. Oh, that's well said. Yeah, it does take uh, capital output. So how you figure out, but there are, there are other podcasts, you know, there's, you know, other ways that are free that aren't as intense as one-on-one -on -one therapy, but they're definitely ways to, I think, dig in and just try to understand, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.